A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, Book 3, The Track of the Storm, Chapter 13, 52. In the black prison of the conciergerie, the doomed of the day awaited their fate. They were in number as the weeks of the year. Fifty-two were to roll that afternoon on the life tide of the city to a boundless, everlasting sea. Before their cells were equipped of them, new occupants were appointed. Before their blood ran into the blood spilled yesterday, the blood that was to mingle with theirs tomorrow was already set apart. Two score and twelve were told off. From the farmer general of seventy, whose riches could not buy his life, to the seamstress of twenty, whose poverty and obscurity could not save her, physical dis diseases engendered in the vices and neglects of men will seize on victims of all degrees in the frightful moral disorder, born of unspeakable suffering, intolerable oppression, and heartless indifference smote equally without distinction. Charles Darnay, alone in the cell, had sustained himself with no flattering delusions since he came to it from the tribunal. In every line of the narrative he had heard, he had heard his condemnation. He had fully comprehended that no personal influence could possibly save him that he was virtually sentenced by the millions, and that units could avail him nothing. Nevertheless, it was not easy, with the face of his beloved wife fresh before him, to compose his mind to what it must bear. His hold on life was strong, and it was very, very hard to loosen. But gradual, by gradual efforts and degrees unclosed a little here. It, clut, it clenched the tighter there. And when he brought his strength to bear on that hand and it yielded, this was closed again. There was a hurry too in all his thoughts. A turbulent and heated working of his heart that contended against res registration. If for a moment he did feel resigned, then his wife and child who had to live after him seemed to protest and to make it a selfish thing. But all this was at first. Before long, the consideration that there was no degree in the fate he must meet, and that numbers went on the same road wrongfully, and trod it firmly every day sprang up to stimulate him. Next followed the thought that much of the future peace of mind enjoyable by the dear ones depended on his quiet fortitude. So by degrees he calmed into the better state when he could raise his thoughts much higher and draw comfort down before it had set in dark on the night of his condemnation, he had traveled thus far on his last way. Being allowed to purchase the means of writing and the light, he sat down to write until such time as the prison lamps should be extinguished. He wrote a long letter to Ru Lucy, showing her that he had known nothing of her father's imprisonment, until he had heard of it from herself, and that he had been as ignorant as she of his father's and uncle's responsibility from that misery until the paper had been read. He had already explained to her that his concealment from herself of the name he had relinquished was the one condition, fully intelligible now, that her father had attached to their betrothal, and was the one purpose he had still exacted on, on the morning of their marriage. He entreated her for her father's sake, never to seek to know whether her father had become ob ob oblivious of the ex 
existing ex existence of the paper. He had had it recalled to him, him for the moment or for good by the story of the tower on that old Sunday until the dear old plane tree in the garden. If he had preserved any definite re remembrance of it, there could be no doubt that he had supposed it destroyed with a Bastille. When he had found a known mention of it among the relics of prisoners which the populace had discovered there, and which had been described to all the world, he besought her, though he added that he knew it was endless, to console her father, by impressing him through every tender means she could think of, with the truth that he had done nothing for which he could justly reproach himself, but had uniformly forgotten himself for their joint sakes. Next to her preservation of his own last grateful love and blessing, and her overcoming of her sorrow, to devote herself to their dear, dear child, he adjured her as they would meet in heaven to comfort her father. To her father her, himself, he wrote in the same strain, but he told her father that he expressly confided his wife and child to his care, and he told him this very strongly, with the hope of rousing him from any despondency or dangerous retrospect towards which he foresaw he might be tending. To Mr. Lorry he commended them all and explained his worldly affairs. That done with many added sentences of grateful friendship and warm attachment, all was done. He never thought of Carton. His mind was so full of the others that he never once thought of him. He had time to finish these letters before the lights were put out. When he lay down on his straw bed, he thought he had done with his world. But it beckoned him back in his sleep and showed itself in shining forms. Free and happy, back in the old house in Soho, though it had nothing in it like the real house, Unaccountably re released in light of heart he was with Lucy again, and she told him it was all a dream and he had never gone away, a pause of forgetfulness, and that he had even suffered and had come back to her dead and at peace, and yet there was no difference in him. Another pause of oblivion and he awoke in the somber morning, unconscious where he was or what had happened, until it flashed upon his mind, this is the day of my death. Thus, had he come they, through the hours to the day when the 52 heads were to fall, and now while he was composed and hoped that he could meet the end of, with quiet and heroism, a new action began in his walking thoughts, which was very difficult to master. He had never seen the instrument was, that was to terminate his life. How high it was from the ground, how many steps it had, where he would be stood, how he would be touched, whether the touching hands would be dyed red which way his face would be turned, whether he, he would be first or might be the last. These and many similar questions to no wise directed by his will obtruded themselves over and over again countless times. Neither will, were they connected with fear. He was conscious of no fear. Rather, they originated in the strange, besetting desire to know what to do when the time came. A desire gigantically dis disproportionate to the few swift moments to which it referred. 
a wondering that was more like the wondering of some other spirit within his than his own. The hours went on as he walked to and fro, and the clock struck the numbers he would never hear again. Nine gone forever, ten gone forever, eleven gone forever, twelve coming on to pass away. After a hard contest with that eccentric action of thought which had last perplexed him, he had got the better of it. He walked up and down, softly repeating their names to himself. The worst of the strife was over. He could walk up and down, free from distracting fancies, praying for himself and for them. Twelve gone forever. He had been apprised that the final hour was three, and he knew he would be summoned some time earlier, inasmuch as the tumbrils jolted heavily as and slowly through the streets. Therefore, he resolved to keep two kick before his mind as the hour, and so to strengthen himself in the interval that he might be able. After that time to strengthen others, walking regularly to and fro with his arms folded on his breast, a very different man from the prisoner walk, who had walked to and fro at La Fosse. He heard one struck away from him without surprise. The hour had measured like most other hours. He devoutly thankful to heaven for his recovered self position possession. He thought, "There is but another now," and turned to walk again. Footsteps in the stone passage outside the door. He stopped. The key was put in the lock and turned. Before the door was opened, or as it opened, a man said in a low voice in English, "He has never seen me here." I kept him out of his way. Go you in alone. I waited near. Lose no time. The door was quite quickly opened and closed, and there stood before him, face to face, quiet, intent upon him, with the light of a smile on his features, and a cautionary finger on his lip. Sidney Carton. There was something so bright and remarkable in his look that, for the first moment. The prisoner misdoubted him to be an apparition of his own imagining, but he spoke, and it was his voice. He took the prisoner's hand, and it was real grasp. Of all the people upon earth, you least expected to see me. He said, "I could not believe it. Believe it to be you. I scarce. I can scarcely believe it now. You are not." The apprehension came suddenly into his mind. A prisoner? No, I am accidentally possessed of a power over one of the keepers here, and in virtue of it I stand before you. I come for her, your wife, dear Darnay. The prisoner wrung his head. I bring you a request from her. What is it? A most earnest, pressing, and emphatic entreaty addressed to you in the most pathetic tones of the voice so dear to you, that you well remember. The prisoner turned his face partly aside. You have no time to ask me why I bring it or what it means. I have no time to tell you. You must comply with it. Take off your boots you wear and draw on these of mine. There was a chair against the wall of the seat cell behind the prisoner. Carton, pressing forward, had already, with the speed of lightning, got him down into it and stood over him barefoot. Draw on these boots of mine. Put your hands on them. Put your will to them. Quick, Carton. There is no escaping from this place. It never can be done. It, you will only die with me. It is madness. It will be madness if I ask you to escape, but do I? When I ask you to pass out at that door, tell me it is madness and remain here. Change that cravat, cravat, of for this of mine, that coat for this of mine. While you do it, let me take this ribbon from your hair and shake out your hair like this of mine. With wonderful quickness. And with the strength both of will and action, 
that appeared quite supernatural. He forced all these changes upon him. The prisoner was like a young child in his hands. Carton, dear Carton, it is madness. It cannot be accomplished. It never can be done. It has been attempted and has always failed. I implore you not to add your death to the bitterness of mine. Do I ask you, my Darnay, to pass the door? When I ask that, refuse. There are a pen, pen and ink and paper on this table. Is your hand steady enough to write? It was when you, when you came in. Steady it again and write while I shall dictate. Quick, friend, quick. Pressing, the hand, pressing his hand to his bewildered head, Darnay sat down at his table. Carton, with his right hand in his breast, stood close beside him. Write exactly as I speak. To whom do I address it? To no one. Carton still had his hand to his breast. Do I date it? No. The prisoner looked up at each question. Carton, standing over him with his hand in his breast, looked down. If you remember, said Carton, dictating, the words that passed before between us long ago, you will readily, readily comprehend this when you see it. You do remember them, I know. It is not in your nature to forget them. He was drawing his hand from his breast, the prisoner chancing to look up in his hurried wonder as he wrote, the hand stopped, closing upon something. Have you written forget them? Carton asked. I have. Is that a weapon in your hand? No, I am not armed. armed. What is it in your hand? You shall know directly. Right on. There are but a few words more. He dictated again. I am thankful that the time has come when I can prove it them. That I do so is no sub subject for regret, for regret or grief. As he said these words with his eyes fixed on the writer, he, his hands slowly and softly moved down close to the writer's face. The pen dropped from Darnay's fingers on the table, and he looked about him vacantly. What vapor is that, he asked. Vapor? Something that crossed me. I am conscious of nothing. There can be nothing here. Take up the pen and finish. Hurry, hurry. As if his, as if his memory were impaired, or his faculties disordered, the prisoner made an effort to rally his attention. As he looked at Carton with clouded eyes and with an altered manner of breathing, Carton, his hand again in his breast, looked steadily at him. Hurry, hurry! The prisoner bent over the paper once more. If it had been otherwise, Carton's hand was again watchfully and softly stealing down. I never should have used the longer opportunity if it had been otherwise. The hand was at the prisoner's face. I should be but have so had so much the more to answer for. If it had been otherwise, Carton looked at the pen and saw it was trailing off into untel unintelligible signs. Carton's hand moved back to his breast no more. The prisoner sprang up with a reproachful look. But Carton's hand was close at, and firm in his nostrils, and Carton's left arm caught him round the waist. For a few seconds, he faintly struggled with a man who hadn't come to lay down his life for him. But within a minute or so, he was stretched insensible on the ground. Quickly, quickly, with his hands... As true to the purpose as his ha heart was, Carton dressed himself in the clothes the prisoner had laid aside, combed back his hair, and tied it with a ribbon the prisoner had worn. Then he softly called, entered there, come in, and the spy presented himself. You see, said Carton, looking up as he kneeled on one knee beside the insensible figure, 
putting the paper in his breast. Is your hazard very great? Mr. Carton, the spy answered with a timid snap on the, of his fingers. My hazard is not that. In the thick of business here, you'll, if you are true to the whole of your bargain, don't fear me. I will be true to you to death. You must be, Mr. Carton. If the tale of 52 is to be the right, being made right by you in that dress, I shall have no fear. Have no fear. I shall soon be out of the way of harming you, and the rest will soon be far from here, please God. Now get assistance and take me to the coach. You, said the spy nervously, him, man, with whom I have exchanged. You go out of the gate by which you have, which you brought me in, of course. I am weak and faint when you brought me in. And I am fainter now that you take me out. The parting interview has overpowered me. Such a thing has happened here often and too often. Your life is in your own hands. Quick, call assistance. You swear not to betray me, said the trembling spy, as he paused for the last moment. Man, man, returned Carton, stamping his foot. Have I sworn by no solemn vow already to go through with this, that you waste the precious moments now? Take him yourself to the courtyard you know of. Place him yourself in the carriage. Show him yourself to Mr. Lorry. Tell him yourself to give him no restorative but air and to remember my words of last night, and his promise of last night, and drive away. The spy withdrew, and Carton seated himself at the table, resting his forehead on his hands. The spy returned immediately with two men. How then, said one of them, contemplating the fallen figure, so afflicted to find that his friend has drawn a prize in the lottery of San Guillotine. A good patriot, said the other, could hardly have been more afflicted if the aristocrat had drawn a blank. They raised the unconscious figure, placed it on the litter they had brought to the door, and bent it, carried it away. The time is short, Evermond, said the spy in a warning voice. I know it well, answered Carton. Be careful of my friend, I entreat you, and leave me. Come then, my ch children, said Barsad. Lift him and come away. The door is closed and Carton was left alone. Straining his powers of listening to the utmost, he listened for any sound that might denote suspicion or alarm. There was none. Keys turned, doors clashed, Footsteps passed along distant passages. No cry was raised or hurry made. They seemed unusual. Breathing more freely in the little while, he sat down at the table and listened again until the clock struck two. Sounds that he was not afraid of, for, their, for he divined their meaning and began to be audible. Several doors were opened in succession and finally his own. A gawler with a list in his hand looked up in, merely saying, Follow me, Evermond. And he followed into a dark, large dark room at the distance. It was a dark, wintry day, and when with the shadows within, and what with the shadows without, he could but dimly discern the others who were brought there to have their arms bound. Some were standing, some seated, some were lamenting and in restless motion, but these were few. The great majority were silent and still, looking fixedly at the ground. As he stood by the wall in the dim corner, while, while some of the 52 were brought in after him, one man stopped in passing to embrace him as having a knowledge of him. It thrilled him with a great dread of discovery, but the man went on. A very few moments after that, a young woman with a slight girlish form 
a sweet spare face in which there was no vestige of color, a large widely open patient eyes, rose from the seat when he had observed her seating, sitting, and came to speak to him. Citizen Evermond, she said, touching him with her cold hand. I am poor little I am a poor little seamstress. Who was with you in La Fosse? He murmured for answer, true. I forget what, what you were accused of. Plots. Though the just heaven knows that I am innocent of any, is it likely? Who would think of plotting with the poor little weak creature like me? The forlorn smiled with which she said it, so touched him that tears started from his eyes. I am not afraid to die, Citizen Evermond, but I have done nothing. I am not willing to die if the Republic, which is to do so much good to us poor, will profit by my death. But I do not know how that can be, Citizen Evermond, such a poor, weak creature. As the last thing on earth that his heart was to warm and soften to, it warmed a soften to this pitiable girl. I heard you were released, Citizen Evermond. I hope it was true. It was, but I was again taken and condemned. If I may ride with you, Citizen Evermond, will you let me hold your hand? I am not afraid, but I am little and weak, and, we, and it will give me much courage. As the patient eyes were lifted to his face, he saw a sudden doubt in them, and then astonishment. He pressed the work-worn, hunger-worn, young fingers, and touched his lips. Are you dying with him, she whispered, and his wife and child, hush, yes. Oh, will you let me hold your brave hand, stranger? Hush, yes, my poor sister, to the last. The same shadows that are on the prison are falling. In that same hour of the early afternoon, on the barrier with the crowd about it, when the coach of going out of Paris drives up to be examined, who goes here? Whom have we writ within? Papers? The papers are handed out in red. Alexander Manette. Physician? French? Which is he? This is he, this helpless, inarticulately murmuring, wandering old man pointed out. Apparently, the citizen doctor is not in his right mind. The, revolutionary, the revolution fever will have been too much for him. Greatly too much for him. Ha, many suffer with it. Lucy, his daughter, French, which is she? This is she. Apparently, it must be. Lucy, the wife of Evermond, is it not? It is. Ha! Evermond has an ass a assignation he elsewhere. Lucy, her child, English, this is she. She and no other. Kiss me, child of Evermond. Now thou hast kissed a good Republican. Something new in thy family. Remember it. Sidney Carton, advocate, English, which is he. He lies here. In this corner of the carriage, he too is pointed out. Apparently, the English advocate is to be a swoon. It is hoped he will recover in the fresher air. It is represented that he is not in strong health and has separately, sadly, from a friend who is under the displeasure of the Republic. It is all, is that all? It, it, it is not a great deal of that. Many, many are under the displeasure of the Republic, and must look out at the little window. Jarvis Laurie Banker, English, which is he? I am he, necessarily being the last. It is Jarvis Lorry who has replied to all the previous questions. 
It is Jarvis Lorry who had alighted and stands with his hand on the coach door, replying to a group of officials. They le leisurely walk round the carriage and leisurely mount the box to look at what little luggage to c it carries on the roof. The country people hanging about, pressing, press near to the coach doors and greedily stare in. A little child carried by its mother has its short arm held out for it that it may touch the wife of an aristocrat who has gone to the guillotine. Behold your papers, Jarvis Lorry, countersigned. One can depart, citizen. One can depart. Forward, my, my postilions, a good journey. I salute you, citizens, and the first danger past. These are again the words of Jarvis Lorry as he clasps his hands and looks upwards, upward. There is terror in the carriage, there is weeping, there is a, the heavy breathing of the insensible traveler. Are you, we not going too slowly? Could they not be induced to go faster? Asks Lucy, asks Lucy, clinging to the old man. It would seem like fighting, my darling. I must not urge them too much. It would rouse suspicion. Look back, look back, and see if we are we are pursued. The road is clear, my dearest. So far, we are not pursued. Houses and twos and threes pass us, pass by us. Solitary farms, ru ruinous buildings, dye works. Tanneries and like open country avenues of leafless trees. The hard, uneven pavement is under us. The soft, deep mud is on either side. Sometimes we strike into the skirting mud to avoid the stones that clatter us and shake us. Sometimes we stick it ruts and sloughs there. The agony of our impatience is then so great that in our wild alarm and hurry we are for getting out and running, hiding, doing anything but stopping. Out of the open country and again among ruinous buildings, solitary farms, dye works, tanneries, and the light cottages in twos and threes, avenues of leafless trees, have these men deceived us and taken us back by another road? Is not this the same place twice over? Thank heaven, no. A village. Look back, look back, and see if we are pursued. Hush. The posting house. Leisurely, our four horses are taken out. Leisurely, the coach stands in the little street bereft of horses, and with no likelihood upon it of ever moving again. Leisurely, the new horses come into visible existence. One by one, leisurely, the new pastilians follow, sucking and plating the lashes of, other, of their wet whips. Leisurely, the old pastilians could there count their money, make wrong additions, and arrive at dissatisfied results. All the time our overfraught hearts are beating at the rate that would far outstrip the fastest gallop of the fastest horses ever fall. At length, the new postilions in their, are in their saddles, and the old are left behind. We are through the village, up the hill and down the hill, and on the low watery grounds. Suddenly the Pastilians exchange speech with animation gesticulation, and the horses are pulled up almost on their haunches. We are presumed, ho, oh, within the carriage there, speak then. What is it? asked Mr. Lorry, looking out the window. How many did they say? I do not understand you. At the last point, how many to the guillotine today? Fifty-two. I said so. A brave number. 
My fellow citizen here would have it 50, 50, 42. Two more heads are worth having. The guillotine goes handsomely. I love it. High forward. Whoop. The night comes on dark. He moves more. He is beginning to revive and to speak intelligibly. He thinks they are still together. He asks him by his name what he has in his hand. Oh, pity us, kind heaven, and help us. Look out, look out, and see if we are pursued. Pursued. The wind is rushing after us, and the clouds are flying after us, and the moon is plunging after us, and the whole wild night is in pursuit of us. But so far we are pursued by nothing else.